So <clears throat> I'll share one experience. And um, I know I'll still to get to the point where we, I talk about how the galaxy was created, and I'll get to that. It just seems there's a, there's a lot of flow going on here in all sorts oh, of places. And that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, so I was lying in bed, and my higher self, my greater being, woke me up. It was about just before three in the morning, and. My, my greater being said, roll over onto your tummy. So I, I rolled over onto my tummy and, and I was laying there like this. And then I felt the presence of beings coming into my room and around me. And then I levitated up off the bed and then I could see these little, little guys and they weren't greys. Um, and, and they turned me around and I was heading for my window and I lived in a house uh, at the time in Ashton in the Adelaide Hills of South Australia. Uh, and, and it was two foot thick stone walls. And, uh, and another time before that, when the greys came in, the walls just shimmered and they just came marching in. So they take their reality with them wherever they go. But we build like submarines with a hard exoskeletal shell to contain our reality with us, like fuselages for planes. We, we take our reality from here and we take it up there into those atmospheric conditions and we do it with hard edge technology, whereas they do it with blending of realities. See? So they can do it from behind this reality and move into this reality. Um, and the military industrial complex can do it too. That's how they abduct people now. It's, I mean, the Manchurian candidate was a classic example of that level of technology, and that was way back when, you know? Um, so I'm, I'm heading towards the window, and my thought was, this is going to be interesting. That's what entered into my mind. And then I went through the window and the window was here and I was halfway out the window going through the window, the glass. Yeah. Like it wasn't there. And I remember looking down and I saw this little guy looking up at me and they were like um, little olive skinned monkey type people. They, they had round heads. They had round no, they had eye sockets like ours. No, round eye sockets. Um, but the pupils, the balls were like ours. Uh, they weren't greys. And he smiled at me and had lots of little teeth, lots of square little teeth. Really interesting. And uh, their bodies, though, were like greys. They were skinny, but they didn't have long fingers like greys. And they were like a dark olive skin. And then uh, he realised I was looking at him and we had this sort of connection. He was a happy little guy and he went like that and then knocked me out. And uh, next thing, I found myself inside the moon. Oh. Huh. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And, you know, um, I shared this story a long time before someone else came out and talked about these little guys on the moon. And the gentleman's name was Jose Escamilla. Hmm. And he said that he witnessed photos of these little monkey-type people on the moon. That he saw, he was privy to actually seeing photos. Um, and I haven't, because I don't do research, I haven't looked for those photos, but apparently he's, he's seen them and they exist. Um, and I just went, wow, he's the only other person I've heard talk about that type of being with the moon. Yeah, I'm the only other person that I've heard. There may be others, but I haven't heard it. Not Grace, these little monkey guys. I don't know how else to call them. Um, they stand about... Three foot high. Yeah, about that tall, three and a half foot. And I was, on, I was in a room on, on the bench and the room was shaped like that and then the wall went like that and there was a long hallway down there. And it was a, a, a really interesting room because the walls were translucent on some sides but solid like a grey on the other side. Um, and, but every, the whole structure was living. It was a uh, living mineral energy. And this is what I, you know, when I hear people talking about concrete structures being built on the moon and all that, um, I don't agree with that. I'm going to say it. Um, I've heard certain whistleblowers talk about concrete structures being built on the moon and that. Um, that's not how things are created on the moon because that reality can't handle the vibrational field of concrete. It's not, you, you don't do that in life. You don't, 
it would be, um, and the concrete won't last long. It'll break down very quickly, no matter how what, all different compounds you try to put in it. It's the way things are worked out in other realities is it's got to be a vibrational match with the creational field of that reality. If there's not a vibrational match, you don't do it because you're going to create such a disruption to that reality. You're going to sabotage your own existence very quickly, especially a place as fragile as the moon. You don't do that. So concrete does not exist in the moon. That is not a reality. Yeah. So I'm very, you know, these are the little things I look for when I'm, I'm listening on the odd occasion when I do listen to somebody. Um, okay. So everything, all the structure inside the moon is grown because the moon originally was built in the Pleiadian system. And there's a long story that mm. uh, I, again, if I go into this, this tangent now, it's going to be a very big one. So it is in my book, our universal journey. I go into great detail about the moon. I actually call the chapters, uh, her story of the moon because it's her story. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and, I, and I talk about the origins of the moon, who built it, why, and how it came to be around the earth. I go into the whole thing. Um, and so I'm, I'm on this bench and all of a sudden my greater being starts to become present. More of me becomes present. And there was this energetic field around me that I could feel just off, off my skin. And it was a little bit of warmth, like heat. And I got up and the little guys just ran out of the room. They completely freaked out because I'm not supposed to get up. That's not meant to happen. And because I became so present and they were connected with me telepathically, um, they didn't want to be around because my energy was freaking them out too much. So um, they're kind of like, um, they do have a hive mentality. So the, the, the area within the hive that they operate in, I don't know if you've had much experience with hive mentalities. So um, in the area in the hive that they operate in, within that realm, within the hive, they have a very limited scope of knowledge mm -hmm. and understanding because the hives, com hives are always compartmentalized, always, yeah? Um, and so there's different groups of collectives that have different hierarchical structures even within the greater collective of the hive mind. Um, so all of a sudden I got hit with this barrage of energy because they were firing all this technology to cripple me, to, to disable me. And the heat got really intense and I focused in on the, um, what I would call the head guy in the moon. It's a male entity. Well, it was back then. Mm -hmm. And we're talking, we're talking 2006. Yeah. Okay. So back then, um, it was a male, uh, draconian Lord that was in charge. Well, was the, the head of operations in the moon at that time. And um, I'll get into his appearance in a moment. And I, I just focused in on that being and I started walking towards him and I was in a different capability, state of capability. And I walked through the wall. So it's a living wall. So I, I connected with the wall. I explained what I was going to move through it. This is all happening like that. Right. Right. Yeah. And then I, I walked through the wall, this translucent wall. Uh, and then I started walking through more walls and all of a sudden the um, technology just dropped away that was being beamed at me. And then I got hit with this other energy and it was him directly one-on-one -on -one with me. And he was given it everything he's, he had. And, and I just kept following, I was tracking that energy and I finally got to him and there was only, there was another translucent wall between me and him. And, and I started communicating with him telepathically through the wall. And, and I said, you know, do, do you now understand? And he just, I could see his shadow too. He just like slumped like that and the, and the energy fell away. And I said, do you truly understand now? Um, and I said, I'm going to walk through that wall. Um, and I did, I walked through that wall and there he is in front of me. And this is the freaky thing. He looked like, you know, the Wraith Lords in Stargate Atlantis. The, the, the wraith? Wraith. Um, they have this species on Stargate Atlantis 
And in that series, they're like an insect uh, hybrid, humanoid hybrid. Um, and they've got like this bony sort of structure on their faces, on the skeletal structure. Um, it, that entity looked really similar to that, except this was Draco origin, Draco humanoid. I see. And it also had a very long black over sort of like clothing, uh, like an overcoat thing, and long straight hair, very similar to the Wraith. Mm-hmm. That's, that, when I saw Stargate Atlantis, I jumped out of my chair. I couldn't believe it. Right. Um, that someone had, had gotten an identity, physical appearance so close, uh, even though it was they were portraying a different species. Uh, it, was, it was really amazing. So when I walked through that wall, once again, I made that statement, do you now understand? And he went, yes. And, and what I was getting him to acknowledge was, and this is really important this moment, Alfred, what I was getting him to acknowledge was when we, when we as a species truly, truly step into our power, truly become our authentic nature and what we truly are, not what everyone else tells us we are, but what we truly are as humane beings, yeah, as fractals of the universe, as the sum total of everything we've seen, done and been in this universe. When we embody that fully integrated self, there is nothing they can do to stop us. Nothing, Alfred. They got nothing. I want you to know that I want everybody who's listening to this, I want you to know, I want you to remember how powerful you are. I so want you to know that about yourself. And that sent a ripple through the empire. I get very passionate about this stuff. <clears throat> so I walked up to him after that and I hugged him. I opened up my heart centre and I completely enveloped him and um, tracked him back through his journey in, his uni- in the universe. Now, remember, this wasn't the personality of George doing this. This was my greater being doing this, running the whole show. I was just an observer, really. I was a, somewhat an experiencer and as an observer of my greater being in action. Um, And we've all had tastes of our greater beings in action in this reality, you know, when um, freak things happen and go, oh, an angel saved me or God saved me. No, it was your greater being that saved you. That's who it really was, you know. Or you're an athlete and you go into the zone, the zone, yeah, and you do this miraculous feat in a, you know, in that moment, and you've never been able to achieve that again. But the feeling that you had in that moment, everything was just in perfect synchronicity. It was effortless, and it all just went so smoothly, and it happened. That's it. You got a taste of what you're capable of, of how you really should be. All right, that's how it works. So you know, I got big doses of that because of the my responsibilities in the exopolitical and cosmopolitical arena. So I've had a lot of this stuff going on in my life. And it's like in Star Wars when the Jedi say, you know, you're just in that flow and you're just one with, you know, reality and life around you. Well, it's, you know, it is. It's all relationship and you're just flowing beautifully in that moment. And it's amazing what you're capable of. Well, there isn't anything you're not capable of in that moment. But you, you work in conjunction with... Um, uh, what's appropriate for the unfoldment of that reality that you're actually a part of in that moment. So um, I tracked him back through everything he's seen, done and being and reminded him of who he was because he was so encapsulated in that Draconian empire and was functioning from a very limited level of awareness of self. And then uh, I felt his whole demeanour just melt and he just, he just slumped. So I just let him go. He fell to the floor. I turned around. And then I bilocated back to my room and uh, yeah. And then I had to integrate. George had to come to terms with what he just experienced. And Amazing. it was a very, very profound uh, experience that one. Uh, I, I want people to know uh, that they know they're terrified of us, Alfred. They are absolutely terrified. And 
when I explain what, how the galaxy was built and why, it's going to take things to another level again as to, as to why there are so many groups interested in us 